My name is Doug O'Keefe, and I am co-producer and host of a series called Inside Leather History, a Fireside Chat. Over the course of a few years, I've been interviewing some of the big names in the leather community for historical preservation, and I've had the privilege of meeting some of the people who've really shaped our leather world. One is right here in the audience, Mama Sandy's right here. And the purpose of these chats is to record for posterity in the Leather Archives of Museum the history of people who have shaped us. So what we're going to do today is videotape the actual chat, which I expect to last between 45 minutes to an hour. Then we're going to open the floor for questions. The question and answer session will not be filmed, so you can ask whatever you like. And I hope we're going to have a great chat today. I have a very special guest, someone I've wanted to interview now for quite a while, none other than Mary Elizabeth Boyd. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, Drew. I don't even understand why you are here, but I'm thrilled to be doing this. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. Tell us about Amelia Courthouse, Virginia, your hometown. That's really the beginning, and that's really a long time ago. It's a very small village. It's outside of Richmond, and it is sort of known for its uh, war between the states. You notice I didn't say civil war. I'm a southern girl. The war between the states, it's sort of known for that because it's about 34 to 37 miles from Appomattox. So it was on the direct retreat. And one of the things that we like to brag about is that when the Union troops came through Amelia, uh, they were going to burn the family, the, the county records. And the county was founded in 1732. So um, General Custis stood in the courthouse door and wouldn't allow them to uh, burn the records. So the Indians may have wiped him out, but he saved our county records. And as a, a matter of interest, Jason's mom lives in Amelia. So. Well, please tell us a little bit about your family history. You have an amazingly fascinating lineage. My family uh, came to this country, almost all of them, very early. Uh, so I'm a long time resident of the United States of America. And um, we lived in a very hot spot area of the country at one time. And I have to say, I'm really proud of my mom because we were 24 miles from Prince Edward County. And anybody in this country knows that that was the first integration in the country. And my mother was a school teacher. And she was asked, are you going to, to go to the school system that had broken out that was called the academy system to keep from going to school with people of color? And she answered, no, I'm going to the public school because I believe in public schools and because the Lord, when he told me to be a teacher, he didn't tell me whether the children were going to be white or black. And so a person that had lived in a segregated world all of her life went to the public school to teach. And I thought it was a wonderful thing. And I was so proud of the fact that when I was out in the country one day, uh, the paper boy, who my mother had taught, uh, delivered our paper. And he threw it into the mud puddle on the side of the porch. And he wrote on our steps, nigger lover. And my mother was so appalled so she said, we'll wash this off. It's okay. He doesn't understand. But when he came to collect his money, she walked to the edge of that porch and threw her money in that same <laughs> You see where I get my grip, don't you? <laughs> Please tell us a little bit about your great-grandfather, John Mercer of Rockenborough. He's got quite a claim to history. Yeah, he was a um, brigadier uh, general in the uh, Civil War, and they actually, War Between the States, have a, a plaque for him 
in Gettysburg. Uh, he didn't do so well. He was one of the people that they get charged over. <laughs> but uh, anyway, my grandmother, uh, being a broken book, uh, went to White House School in Richmond as a little girl, and that's kind of a fun thing that, because if you've ever been to the White House of the Confederacy, um, she, she would say that they would stand on the second floor porch, which didn't have any railings, and they would say, kids, remember little Jeffy Davis? He fell off of that porch and killed himself. So, <laughs> meaning enough to those children. <laughs> How were you introduced to the leather world? I don't know that I was ever introduced. I think I fell into it. <laughs> My father was um, a horseman. And I think you will find a lot of people in the leather community that started with a uh, introduction into either western horses, boots. Um, I grew up in a day and age where Western movies were a big thing. Uh, Lash LaRue was my favorite. And that's whips and black outfits and things. So that kind of gives you an idea how it started. But I really loved my father's boots too when he was putting them on. And I always knew there was a stigma. And I was kind of a, uh, a Marlon Brando, Salminio type of person. And I always thought, even when the carnivals came to town, those people with all of those tattoos and those earrings, boy, they were so exotic, you know, and I kind of had a little thing for them. My mother was appalled. <laughs> I thought it was just wonderful to talk to them and find out that this was a country girl that hadn't been exposed to those things. Well, tell us a little about the leather world that you knew when you first came out. Into it, I should say. Um, I was always attracted. The one thing I can tell you that probably started me a little bit more than boots and a little bit more than the rodeo and all of that kind of stuff was I was an avid dancer. I loved the tea dances. And I even sponsored some of them in the D.C. area. And the tea dances were a time that everybody came out. It wasn't just the Twinkies out there dancing. It was leather people. It was everybody. And I used to dance with this guy that always wore leather pants. And he had a thing attached to his belt loop that I called a squirt. I don't even think they use that term anymore. But as he danced, and I would always dance with him, that squirt would go between my legs, flogging. I thought, ooh, this is something kind of neat here. <laughs> you know, I kind of like this. What is this all about? And the other thing is, anybody that is a dancer, you get it straight right away when you go in. That dance floor is full. There are lots of different type of people out on that dance floor. You decide, I want to be associated with those guys over there. So let's move across this dance floor and get in with the group we want to be associated with. The group we know, the group we like, the group we want to be a part of. And a lot of that was the leather. Because the leather would come to the uh, tea dances early in the day before they go to the D.C. Eagle. Because basically that was the name of town in D.C. And uh, so that was kind of my first introduction, and um, then I lived for eight years with one of the uh, Spartans in uh, D.C., and I kind of lived underground at that time. Going back a little bit to your first grade years, I remember you telling me a little bit about a present you received that had very special interest when you were in the first grade. Tell us what was that. Oh, yeah, I, I, we all remember this. One Christmas, uh, what I wanted Santa Claus to bring me was I wanted a cowgirl suit and boots and a hat. Well, Santa Claus exactly couldn't find boots my size. So they bought me these Jean Archery boots that were a little bit too big for me. I had this Dale Evans cowgirl suit that was red with white 
vinyl fringe on it. I thought it was the prettiest thing I ever had in my entire life. The first day back going to the first grade, I put that suit on. I mean, all kids want to the first day back at school to either take what you got or wear what you got to school. It's a common thing. You want to show everybody what you got. I came down now, just picture this. My mother was a school teacher. She said, oh, dear, you cannot wear that. I said, oh, but it's so pretty. I really want to wear it. She says, you cannot wear that. The kids will all laugh at you because I walked to school. I lived in the village. I walked to school. She said, you can't. I said, Mom, I have to wear it. She said, okay, but I'm telling you, they're going to all laugh at you. And indeed, they did. And the boots were too big, and he was this little girl, and there was all of the high school people laughing at me. But do you think I gave a damn? I didn't care. I thought it was beautiful. And it, I believe, shaped me the rest of my life. I'm going to do what's right for me. I'm going to do what I want to do. And I walked the whole way and the whole way back, and nobody was going to laugh at my cowgirl suit. <laughs> You alluded earlier to your father being a horseman. In our previous conversations, you've actually talked about a specific interest in his boots. What was that? What did that mean to you? Well, his boots were too hard to take off. I think we all, if you have a good relationship with your father, you have wonderful memories of something you did as a child or an experience you had. And he would come in from riding. He was an English uh, saddle rider and uh, sometimes I would ride with him. I had a pony that we would ride together and my pony would follow his horse and I would ride in hunts and I would ride in trail rides with him and when he would come in it was hard for him to get his boots off and so I would help him get his boots off and because he there weren't too many things that were asked of us as children but one of them was to polish his boots I like that. I'm not a boy in, in this stage of my life, but I can understand how the boys enjoy the servitude of polishing boots and seeing the boots and um, having them for the person that you that you cared about. Tell us about the epiphany that the Tom of Finland drawings afforded you. When I saw them, I thought, oh my, these Tom of Finland drawings, and you see, I'm an artist, so <laughs> these Tom of Finland drawings really had a special meaning for me. I thought that Tom, in his um, exaggeration of the butt, the biceps, the boots. Don't tell me that all of you all don't drip when you see <laughs> Even though we don't see a lot of Tom of Finland leather today, I grew up where anybody who wanted to be somebody, they dressed like Tom of Finland in those bars. They took a stance. They stood like those drawings. They put those glasses on. The bars were so goddamn dark, they couldn't have seen them if their life depended on it. If they tried to walk, they would have fallen down if there was something nigh them. But everybody did it because they just took a stand. Well, I think they took a stand because they couldn't see. I, I mean, it was physically impossible. I mean, truthfully. But I love those drawings. And I have to say, the other drawings, the inner face, which are entirely different, are a drum from Drummer Magazine. Drum was so nasty. Drum was so dirty. His boots were always untied. His pants were kind of coming down a little bit. You could smell him on the page. You know, I mean, that was, that was the visualization and the part you saw when you saw those drawings. The message that they communicated was just fabulous. You've been quoted as saying that leather is pushing the envelope. What does that mean? Um, well, I've sort of pushed the envelope and everything I've done all my life. 
So, but I do like uh, the idea of um, the passion, the responsibility, the protocol, the push the envelope. And once you get it, and it's not that people preach to younger people about old guard. I don't think anybody wants anybody today to say, how as a 20 year old can I be an old guard? Because this, it is a progression of time. It is a growth. But once you have learned those protocols, you can't miss a beat. You can't tell me that anybody that came through that would ever have dirty boots when they're out. You can't tell me that they wouldn't know not to touch their cover. You can't tell me that they wouldn't know when to take their cover off. I was so upset with my picture that was in this booklet. I do have a movie star picture <laughs> that I give for presentations or whatever. How dare they show me without a cover and talking on the microphone. Uh, I was so upset about that. It's such a silly nothing. But once you get the beat, you know that you would never do that to a person. I have my cover here. I'm not wearing it because I respect you that you have come for this. I earned this. The person I earned it is in here with me. I had to make it my own. I put the chain across the top. You don't think he'd ever put all this guardy goo on it. But I'm guardy goo, and so therefore that's my form of leather. And I had to make it mine. Because when it was his, every time I wore it, it went a little bit this way, a little bit that way, which wasn't too cool. It was like he was correcting me. This is mine. Don't quite wear it that way. And I promise you of something else, I carry this with me when I travel. I'm not checking this. I, I had, I'm incapable of earning a, a cup from somebody. And this is mine, and it will be mine until I die. But I am honoring you by putting it under my arm today and having it here. But whenever I'm doing something of importance, my cover is going to be with me. This interview needed my cover because this tells you who I am. And that's something that is in my protocol of my day and my age. In, in your leather journey, what one leather activity most intrigued you or shocked you upon first exposure? The shock... I'm not shocked at very many things and things I disapprove of, but a couple things come to mind. Um, one of them in uh, IML many years ago when it was still in the Congress uh, Hotel, and everybody gathered in the lobby. Wonderful, wonderful days. I'm sad that some of you didn't weren't there for those days. Um, there was a, uh, in fact, we were talking about this the other day. There was an old master, no, a young master that came in who um, had probably called himself a master. I'm not sure he deserved that title. He had two slaves, and they were hooked up, and he brought them right in the middle of probably 200 people in that lobby easy every night and threw them to their knees and told them to put the hands out as they did. He put out his scar in both of their hands and the colds went all the way into their skin, burned very deeply, and you could see they were in a great deal of pain. And there were several masters in the room and they looked across the room and they said, Masters, face to the wall and Mary Elizabeth and we turned our faces to the wall meaning we don't approve of this you as a master have a right to do with a slave as you want but you do it in private, you don't do it as a show 
in front of other people. It's inappropriate. And if you think anybody is going to commend you for that or say, job well done, or how big you are, you're not big. You're little when you do that. So that was shocking. Um, sometimes in my early days when I would go to IML, people would come in with faces and it was a movie about that time. We used to call them Silence of the Lamb people. We, <laughs> we, would, we would give names to these people that were a little extreme in the community. One of them was Rommel with his boys. And any of you who have been to IML in the early days probably know exactly who I'm talking about when he came in with his little group. I don't know that they were shocking. But it was a different thing. Um, most joyous times, it's just the pride I have. The pride in putting on my leather. The pride in wearing my leather. The pride in walking in with my leather. Uh, the pride in owning it. The pride in all of you uh, that are a part of it. The pride in the friends I have in level that I've made, I would say that's the best. You're here. Absolutely. I will tell you one little funny, funny thing, too. One time we were in San Francisco, and it was drummer days. And um, after the contest, um, we went out to eat, and there wasn't anything open. And they sent us to uh, the Hamburger Mary's, and they weren't really open uh, for food. There were a lot of people in there. And they told us to go over to this uh, other place. And this was Mike Zoll, too. Ask Mike about it. He'll know. Um, and we went to this Chinese restaurant. And we came in, and we noticed everybody was watching us. Now, we had full leather on. And Irwin, who used to do the voiceovers for Drummer many years ago, had this voice. It was just fabulous. And he was talking out. And there were a couple of people there that had big clunkers in their mouths and big clunkers through their noses. And the restaurant was convinced we were the village people. <laughs> no matter how many times we told them, we're not the village people. Oh, just one little song. Just give us one little song. Just give us one <laughs> well, you hold the title First Lady of Leather. Tell us how you attain that. What does it mean? Well, it's not a title, a uh, earned title. Um, it was given to me, and it was a, um, a person from Washington, D.C. that was Mid-Atlantic, I believe Troy was Mid-Atlantic drummer. You know, I forget when, I was on the drummer board, and I forget when drummer and leather sir exactly the year, but I think he was drummer. And he was competing in San Francisco. Well, it would be drummer then. And um, I worked at the White House 17 years doing the Blue Room Christmas tree. And um, so everybody would laugh about that, that I was just a volunteer there, but my friends worked in the flower shop there and got me down doing these trees. And so Troy said, Mary Elizabeth, you're the first lady of leather. Well, it just caught. And sometimes um, it comes home to bite me because one time someone said, is it because you're the oldest woman in the book? Yes, you know, I don't really think, I think it was uh, a title of honor that he meant. You held the first Claw Nation party. Tell us about that. Well, I came to Claw, and it dawned on me that Dennis and Bob Miller were working so hard, and all the volunteers they had, that they kept talking about it being bigger and bigger and bigger every year. Well, you physically... It gets to a point, and I think 
Mama Reinhardt will understand this too, that when you give fundraisers and things and you want them to become bigger, how can you do it bigger? It becomes almost a physical impossibility of how you can make something bigger. And so it dawned on me that if they were doing charities and we were doing charities national, why couldn't the people go home and give a party where the money would go to call? That we could do, I mean, I don't have the facilities in Cleveland to put a party on, but I could do one in Washington, D.C. And my form has always been of doing a garden party in my home. And so I did a garden party. I cooked all the food and they had a full dinner. Uh, Dennis sent me uh, some auction items. I collected auction items. And I have to say, the people by the will of God came to that party. I charged them $20 a ticket, which wasn't anything for a, uh, the dinner of the type we gave them. We gave them uh, irons of beef, we gave them salmon, we gave them anything open bar, everything known to man. And we had beautiful things, and then we had the auction. And uh, people gave things, people brought things, many people obviously did not give $20. Many people gave $50 or $100 checks. Some of them were not even people in the leather community, just came to support this. Uh, I never even really told them except, you know that little thing in Cleveland, call, call, and they do charity work. I never really told them where the money was going. Because in that day and age, it wasn't really carefully delineated and you weren't able to specify your hometown charity. And I would not tell them how much I had raised. But I was so ballsy <laughs> that I stood up in the dinner and challenged everybody there to beat what I could raise. That I was going to have a party, I challenge you to raise more money than I can. And we raised $3,000. Well, that was a lot. That was a lot of money, if you think about it. And for a long time, it was the highest they'd ever had come in. And it was at home. It was not at a bar. And so I'm very proud of that because it really started something. But I did say to Bob and Dennis, you cannot ask people in other towns to raise money unless they have a piece of the action. Maybe you need to give them a percentage. And now you are able to name your charity in your town when you give your party. And it was a really fun, fun thing. I had a great time doing it. And they've just taken my picture with all of the guys for the posters, the call posters. <laughs> Well, how have you seen Claw evolve over the years, from your point of view? Well, it's a lot more attendance than it was in the beginning. Um, there really were more auction items, though, years ago. You that were here many years ago know there were a huge amount of things, and the things that bought big bucks were some very main people in the community, Tom Ninkowski and uh, Jim, and people like that that died and would donate their things and people really wanted them and they would pay thousands of dollars to own a piece of those people's uh, leather. And uh, so I, I've seen it that there are not so many uh, auction items. I've seen more people. They didn't have uh, as many workshops. In fact, they were having trouble. They needed workshops. They needed because of their uh, Schedule C status, they needed workshops to uh, be able to be in that category. And uh, so I've, I've seen it change a lot. Um, I think that my suggestion to them, and please take this the right way, said, because they work so hard and they do really do a lot. And with as anything that gets bigger and bigger and bigger, MAL has changed remarkably because of the number of people. The centaurs used to cook all the meals. Well, can you imagine them cooking all the meals now? I mean, it would be a physical impossibility. 
they used to cook all those breakfasts and things. It, it gets to a point you can't do some of the same things you used to do, surely because of numbers and because of the cost of buses and the cost of things that as you are involved in. But my suggestion to them would be um, it is a charity thing. Uh, it has been billed as that. It has been billed as um, no contest. And I believe that if we're going to have workshops and things like that, if you have a package, you should be able to take part in everything. If you don't have a package, maybe there should be a little charge because it is uh, a charity thing. And that maybe, maybe there should be more workshops on how do you raise money in your community? Who are the people that have been successful? What are the successful events? And maybe even an award with people bringing information and pictures about their successful events. Maybe that would uh, be a wonderful thing to do in the guise of that this is charity. Shifting gears a little bit, how do you see the role of women in the leather community? When I came into the leather community, women didn't have a role. And I would hate to tell you how many women come up to me at events and ask me, how, why are you accepted? How can you, how did you get by you? Uh, how can I be accepted? I can't tell them how because I don't know. I'm kind of... Uh, a horse of a different color, and it's really hard for me to tell them how. I never had any resistance. Never. So, it, that's kind of a hard thing for me to address. Um, I think that women, I think that um, anybody that has felt alienated from a group, it is a matter of time. It is a matter of react. Uh, uh, into action. I am kind of surprised when I judged um, International Mr. Death Leather some years ago. Uh, I was very surprised when some of the women did not want to be called gay. They wanted other terms, terms that I felt could be derogatory to a gay person. Queer. They want to be called queer folks. I was very surprised at that. And I said, where does that come from? Well, I think it was an evolution. I think everything is an evolution of being included, finding your own way. I think that all things that change need evolutions. And many things happen in those evolutions. Uh, I think that women definitely have a place um, I think that women are a proud sort. I think they are an interesting sort. I think that even men who don't want to associate with women, when they associate, rather find them interesting. I can say for myself, when I was first introduced to Drummer, when Drummer was still owned by Amsterdam, and the boys would come over here, they didn't wanted to pretend I existed. If I came into the room, they wouldn't look at me. I'm not kidding you. There'd be a cocktail party. I was on the drummer board. And you think I wasn't going to the drummer cocktail party? I was going, and I thought, my God, they're going to like me whether they don't like me or not. <laughs> I'm going to make them see that I have as much strength as they do. I have as much respect for them, and I would like for them to respect me. And those men ended up by eating dinner in my house, in their full leather, and it was so sexy, because if you... They ended up being rats with the things they did with Drummer. And anybody that was there knows the ratty things that happened. I don't need to go into that. But in that time, European leather people have a 
a little twist of their own. And if you're into it, you know what I mean. And I'm a woman and I see it. When they sit down and they stretch that boot leg out and heel their boot into the floor, it's sexy. They work those boots. It's like I don't admire Hitley, Hitler in the Third Reich, but it's like the Third Reich is sitting there with those boots when they do those boots stretched out. And they, stay, they stand straight, they sit straight, and if they have mustaches, they set their mustaches. I can tell you, every man I've ever been associated with, any way, shape, or form, I can tell you the way he sits in the chair, I can tell you the way he sets his mustache. Because that's part of him. And that's the sexy part of him. Where do I go after that? <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little bit about your professional work. What is healing design? I, um, I'm an interior designer by profession. Um, I work design all my life. I'm an artist in the inside of me. Always painted and did drawing and things as a child. Um, I took a job with the Veterans, it was Veterans uh, Administration in that day and age. It's Veterans Affairs now. And all of a sudden, I happened to be sitting in an office when all of the medical centers began to rise up across the United States because the World War II veteran was going to peak in our facilities and we needed to build new facilities. I can truthfully tell you, and it's, it is a source of pride with me, I'm not bragging, but it's a source of pride with me. I have worked on more replacement hospitals, nursing homes, and medical facilities than any designer in the world. And I, it will always be that. And all of a sudden, as I was sitting in the right place at the right time, and this was all happening, I began to know there was not one product to go in to a facility that was called a healthcare product. Now the world is full of them. But there wasn't one flooring, there wasn't one anything that was listed as that. And as I began to dig and find floorings that could be maintained, floorings that were bang for the buck, because I was really the steward of your money. Your money pays for those VA hospitals. Your taxes paid my job. I began to invent colors that were better, products that were better. And I would tell anybody that would come in, you know, you're paying my salary. I can tell you what we need. And they started developing these products. And all of a sudden, the light bulb went out. You know, we shouldn't just be picking something that's pretty or something that works or something that's cheap. We should be doing healing design. And I started talking about it. I talked all over at every health care function they had about healing design. Hospital, an army runs on its stomach, a hospital runs on its floors. What will perform? What will be? What will tell you an Alzheimer's patient? Don't go through that door because they're wandering. What will keep a person from having a hesitation and falling? Hesitation is a fall. A fall is a broken hip. A broken hip is death. So, I mean, it began to dawn on me, and as it dawned on me, it began to dawn on other people, too. But I was one of the early ones that did that. I, through the ASID, which is American Society of Interior Designers, I am in the healthcare. I was the first one to go in the Healthcare Hall of Fame, and I'm a fellow in ASID, and I'm very proud of that. I read that you've been on Good Morning America. Oh yeah, when I was doing the uh, White House Christmas trees, they come rolling in there. First Martha Stewart comes rolling in there. And they tell me, uh, you don't ever speak for the White House. You are serving at the 
um, capacity of the people you're serving by. Uh, and um, you never say anything. The first lady talks or her spokesperson talks. You don't talk. And so they told me, Martha Stewart's going to interview in here, uh, and we want you to be the person she interviews. And I said, you know, I don't feel comfortable when you told me not to say these things. Oh, well, you can do it. Well, the first thing, just don't talk about the house. The first question she asked me is, how tall are the ceilings in this room? This is blue room with the big tree. Um, and other statistics that I knew I wasn't supposed to say. And why, she asked me, why are the windows dirty? Well, you know, I shouldn't be talking about the White House about that. I mean, I only volunteer work in my uh, And I had done it a long time, and I knew enough not to do that. Uh, but the business with Martha Stewart never got shown. But the interview on Good Morning America with Charles Garalt was, you know how they do that every year with the things. If you come to see me, I've got a copy of it. <laughs> What's the biggest misconception that people have about you? I heard Sandy say this, or someone say this in Sandy's uh, interview that uh, I saw for the first time today. They think I'm unapproachable. People will say, I've always wanted to talk to you, but you've always got people around you, and I never felt you could come in. I'm going to smack their face when they say that. <laughs> I'm the most approachable person in the whole damn world. If you haven't got fortitude enough to get through those people, then you shouldn't be talking to me. <laughs> well, how do you see the future? of the leather community? Good God, you know I don't know that. <laughs> no one knows that. I think it, again, is going through that push and pull, the same thing I talked about with the women. Uh, I think that all of these fetishes, um, it's very hard for me. I, I want them to have a place. I want them to be there. I, I want to enjoy them. And when Alex was... Uh, the ABW. Alex opened my eyes to a lot of things because Alex had such a wonderful thinking about fetishes and what he was into. And Alex is so good looking and he's so wonderful in those fetishes that I really saw a lot more. It's damn hard when I see a bunch of dog heads coming in and comparing that with Tom of Finland. Stuff it's hard. It's really hard for me. All I can think about is my grandchildren would love those dog heads. You know? <laughs> I mean, it, it's just hard for me. I think that it is evolving into um, a more acceptance as everything is becoming a little bit more acceptance. I think it's going to still be um, groups people that are more um, into the same things, which it is kind of now. Uh, I think that um, people like myself, and other people have heard me say this, we are just shadows in the passing of time. When you want to know about the days we lived in, my God, if you had ever been there, it would, Sandy talked about this too, you, we just cannot tell you. Our lives were changed completely by AIDS. Our Rolodexes were wiped out. Our friends were wiped out. We would go to funerals, and we were not crying for the person that was dead there. We were crying for all of them we had lost. And you realize that. It gave you a heavy heart. It gave you the same heavy heart that you see on the news today. Turn the damn thing off. You can't afford to have those heavy hearts. You need to move on. And I'm so happy that people have come into the leather community and introduced the new things, even if I don't understand it. I'm so happy for it. I'm so happy of the joy and the passion they have, of what they are into. I have to be happy for that. 
But I do think you're going to see a lot more things to come. And then I think you're going to see a swing back. I think all of this business with uh, Master Mike and the workshops are trying to show people uh, some of the things that were their passions and were their joys. I don't think they're going to come out exactly the way that they are being taught. I think they're going to come out in a little bit different dimension. When you build your own dildos here, I don't think they're going to look like the ones that Tom or Finland and those guys had. I think they're going to have little twists to them. I think they're going to be maybe puppy penises or, <laughs> or something else along the way. I mean, I don't really know. I'd be a it was always a fool that San Zan says they know everything, and I'm not a fool, and I certainly don't know what it's going to be. I'm waiting to see. I'm always looking around the corner. When you judge a contest, and you see a group of contestants there before you, what do you like to ask of them? And what qualities do you look for in a successful contestant? I want to know why they're doing it. Uh, that's the first thing. And are you prepared to represent who you are standing there to do? Uh, I also want to get into their head, any way I can get into their head, because I can't pick the right person. I might think the person looks right on the outside, but if they don't have the right inside, they shouldn't be doing that contest. And you'll find they'll disappear and you'll never see them again. <laughs> or they won't do the things they're supposed to be doing. So that's kind of, it's like um, a guy I judged. And he couldn't understand. He was the beefiest one on the stage. And he had pretty good answers. But he was running for a bar title. And he playing long, which the interview is always 60% in most of the contests, said in the interview that he didn't expect to be in that city anymore, that he had bought a house somewhere else, and he didn't know when he'd be back. Do you really think I was going to give him that bar type? He had sunk himself. I also, and there's a couple of men of color here, and one year I was sitting in the cell block, and Vern Stewart was sitting next to me, and a gentleman was asked on the stage at the cell block, which only started in Chicago, for any of you that don't know this, and he was playing along, asked, how can we get more men of color into contests and in the community? And his answer was, I will go to the colored bars. Do you really think that that man was going to win that cell block title? That, that was the year I won, Mr. Sullivan. <laughs> Do you really think that anybody, no matter what he did from that point, was going to listen to what he had to say? That was about the stupidest answer I ever heard. <laughs> so, I mean, those are the kind of the things you look. And being where I'm from, you stand on that stage, and I've seen this in many contests. You've got dirty boots, you're going diamond. You don't have respect for me. You don't have respect for the title you're running for. You don't have respect for the audience. Or if you have a Ralph Lauren belt buckle. And you think I don't see those things. I see them. I, we even had a guy that ran for D.C. Eagle that came up without any socks and tied up wingtips for his formal leather. Now, come on. I mean, really. So, I mean, a little common sense, but I would tell you one thing uh, in my area. Any, this is not really the question, but anybody that out there... If you can mentor your contestants, they don't see themselves those ways. Do you know how many terrific contestants we see at IML that don't have a ghost of a chance because nobody told them? Nobody told them not to do that. Nobody told them 
what their good side was. When Daryl was running for one of his titles, and Daryl was runner-up at IML, I said, what have you done spectacular? He said, I can't think of anything. And then he thought, and he said, I was in Oliver when I was a little boy. And we talked a lot about that. I mean, you need to mentor those people to get them to pull things up out of them and to show them what their best sides are because they need to show that. It doesn't mean you're changing them from who they are because I would never want anybody to be a contestant and be say things that they're not they don't really believe or that they are not. But you need to mentor them along that way. So in conclusion, we have a lot of title holders here at CLAW that are going on to IML this year. What advice can you offer them? Go to the forum next that I'm going to be on <laughs> and chase them in terrible. But I will tell you, know yourself. If you know yourself, talk to yourself in the mirror. Know yourself. The one thing that I would say to anybody, and I encourage people every day of my life to run for contests, you'll never know yourself like you know yourself after you've run for a contest. You'll never meet as many people as you meet at a contest, but you have to know yourself. Know why you're doing it. Know what it's for. Know what you have to offer. Know what the title has to offer for you. But also, don't stand up there and say, with this title, I could do this, that. You could do it without the title. It just gives you a good, it greases the slide for you. It does grease the slide, though. But just know what unique thing you have. And you may have to pull that up out of yourself, what uniqueness about you that you have. Maybe I never thought about it before. But it would be to your benefit to pull it up anyway. Mary Elizabeth Boyd, I would like to thank you for a wonderful chat. And for all of you. Thank you very much. I really.